All right, we're back. Thank you all. We're, we've had a little break and now we're back at work. Uh, although we probably were working during break, which is typical for all of us. So um, the committee, we've we heard a great deal of testimony on S120. My suggestion on this bill is to have um, take a minute and let Jen go through the proposed amendment that that I have put up on our web page. Uh, then um, we'll uh, let, let's take some time to go through that, and then comments will go through with a kind of a discussion mode if we can. But our goal this morning is then to move S120 over to Thursday. We certainly need more time. And I would suggest that we're going not going to be able to pass this bill until Friday. And so what for Friday, we have H430. We're going to look at H430 today briefly, and then we'll try to act on 430 uh, as soon as we can, along with some of the other bills that we're looking at tomorrow. So our goal is to our 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 goal is to pass all of the bills out that we have on our agenda uh, today and tomorrow and Friday. But I'm just re restructuring the the timeline because we've heard so much new testimony today. And I think it will be helpful for all of us to dive into it. And we keep. And I will say this, we keep getting emails and notes from people wanting us to add things into our budget memo, wanting us to add things into our bills. And, you know, we're just about, we're full up with information. <laughs> so, I mean, there's no reason why you can't keep sending things for those of you who are um, out in the, in the audience. We, we certainly do welcome your comments, but understand that our timing is very tight and we'll do just the best we can. And we have a, another year of our session to cover some of the things that we can't get to this, this year. So Jen, hello, there you are. Um, why don't you just sending the 430 language to Nellie for later? Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, let's do. Let's go through the 120 uh, proposed amendment, and then um, we'll move on to 430 and budget memo. Okay, great. I will put up that language. And and just uh, committee FYI, I did send you a an email about this over the weekend, uh, hoping that you would just have a chance to look at it. I tried to triage some of the more problematic and difficult uh, complex areas out of S one thirty two to streamline that a bit, and then to add some comments in to um, S120 that reflected, I think has reflected some of the testimony we heard today, but the, the language certainly is open for um, modification, further modification, of course, but so Jen. Okay, um, so this is, um, I didn't put it in as an actual amendment format, um, but some proposals from Senator Lyons. Uh, the first relates to this, um, study committee that she has rebranded a little bit different name although did you send me even something else after this that I did not I did I thought that it, it should we should elevate it its value to commission rather than committee so I want to call okay. it commission on affordable I think that's but that's another okay uh, to deal with it we now. can we can discuss um because it had, was of a short duration and, and comes back with a report, it seemed like a study committee, but you can call it whatever you want. Um, so the change in the findings, a uh, couple of changes. One relates to adding a finding on the cost of prescription drugs. Um, so it says the ever increasing cost of prescription drugs continues to significantly increase the cost of health insurance and limit individuals ability to access care. Probably because should say care times. and treatment, you know, because drugs are treatment. But okay, let me. Yeah, can make changes as we 
go along. All right, make that in my version. Um, so I've, I've indicated all of the changes in uh, highlight with new language in bold. Um, so again, there's the change to the, whether it's a committee or a commission, but instead of being joint legislative healthcare affordability, it's a committee or commission on affordable, accessible healthcare. Um, so I've renamed that in a couple of places. Um, then under the powers and duties, the committee shall explore opportunities to make healthcare, including prescription drugs, more affordable. And then in the under the powers and duties, the second one on the all payer model, uh, looking at the efficacy, taking that out and changing it instead um, to look at how alignment of Medicaid, Medicare and private insurance, patient care management rules and guidelines affect access to and affordability of care, including access to referrals for extended care, counseling and social services. Then I think that is it on, on what has been S120. And then there are certain provisions from S132 that are included. And so I tried to indicate where in S132 those had come from. So the first couple of sections deal with ACOs. The first one here being uh, what had been section five in S132 on data collection and analysis. And then I took out the language referring to what the Green Mountain Care Board would, would do with that information because th those provisions are not in this version. Um, so it would have, still have the ACO collect and analyze clinical data um, and report that to the Green Mountain Care Board, but it would not be specifically used by the board to inform other work that they're doing um, because that other work is no longer called for. What is now here section um, four had been section six in S-132 is that language giving the auditor, state auditor access to the ACO's records. Then I've left a placeholder in here for health insurance coverage for hearing aids. Um, you have the language that you're recommending in the budget memo to be part of DFR's benchmark plan review. Um, was a little unclear what to do with uh, what, if anything, to do with the remaining provisions at this time, um, including you may need a better understanding of what Medicaid currently covers. It's my understanding from them. They think they already cover uh, what the bill would have them cover. So you may want to hear that from them. Then we move to the state health improvement plan. So what is section 15 in S-132? And this is where uh, the bill would give specific direction to the Commissioner of Health and not just the Secretary of Human Services or designee to be the one to adopt the state health improvement plan and update it as necessary. And then a new section that would be, um, would have the Commissioner of Health submitting um, copies of the current state health improvement plan by January 15th, along with any updates to the plan and a timeline for adoption of a new state health improvement plan to this committee and the House Committees on Healthcare and Human Services. Um, then we have additional reports that come from S-132 just renumbered here. So the first is the Green Mountain Care Board report on increases in health insurers administrative expenses for the last five years and how that compares with increases in the consumer price index. Next is again renumbered. Um, the section 18 of S-132 report requiring the ACO to provide a description of its initiatives to connect primary care practices with social service providers and have that report come in by January 15th. And also is that we have the primary care visits without cost sharing reports from section 19 of S-132. No changes in those. Um, it seemed that everything could take effect on passage because in the underlying bills, they all took effect on passage. So none of the ones, unless you do something else with um, the hearing aids or something else didn't require separate effective dates. And then there would likely need to be a new title reflecting whatever you have in the bill. You want me to take it down? Sure. We can discuss, okay. Yeah, so um, committee um, open to 
conversation, questions, thoughts at this point. I, I do want to add one thing as we were going through the, <clears throat> the work that we have done. And uh, I just wanted to remind us that in H315, which has now been allowed to become law, um, there is a support for a JFO to hire a consultant um, to study the, um, the ACO. So there will be some, that will be uh, what I think we might consider an objective analysis of the ACO. That so the only piece I'm aware of that has JFO hiring a consultant, I think is around, uh, and maybe Nolan can speak to this, but was around advising the committees on global commitment the global commitment waiver. I don't think JFO okay. was going to be hiring someone to do an ACO. The now. ACO, right, you're right. right. So, but right. it is tangentially, it is very much related to that work. Uh, Senator Terenzini, go ahead. Thank you, Senator Lyons. I, I just took a note when we were hearing from one of our witnesses about the S-120 bill and uh, if it's true, it's a little, little concerning, and, and unless I misunderstood, this individual said that uh, S120 would has the potential to increase adult premiums by a thousand dollars more per year if we increase the Dr. Dinosaur um, uh, funding. And does anyone have any insight into that? I think we can find you the report. It was done a few years ago. Um, and if others have other recollections, I'm happy to let you respond. Yeah, that was in the context of several reports that have been done on primary care, Dr. Dinosaur and, um, and others, and it was in Devin Green's testimony. So there is, some, there is some, spe some specific testimony that as we go through that testimony will be helpful maybe to focusing on the goals of the, of the group. It, it just seems, you know, I'll read the studies and look into it a little more. It just seems a little counterproductive to what we're trying to do here as we as we look to expand coverage for children, yet we're saying you're going to have to pay more on your premiums to adults. It, I, I don't like the balance, so. Yeah, that and so it's something that will have to be weighed out, risks and benefits. And so I see Senator Hardy and then Senator Cummings. Do you, Senator Cummings, were you going to comment on are both of you going to comment well, is, on this? Is the Dr. Dinosaur in this bill? No, that's in another bill. I, I think it was the study piece, uh, you know, analyzing if that expansion would be a route to take for savings. And so okay. then the comment. But that's was, a study. There's yeah. no. All yeah. right. Yeah. So any, anything we do in this bill wouldn't. I mean, so this bill does include um, on the top of page four of what we just went over and in the in S120 itself um, in number C5 opportunities made available by the Biden administration. It does look at expanding uh, Medicare to cover individuals between 50 and 64 years of age and for expanding Vermont's Dr. Dinosaur program to cover individuals up to 26 years of age. Um, no, that's... So so the, and that that's so that's study. that's the study. Right. There is a link in Devin's testimony. I haven't clicked on the link yet, but it may be uh, a quick way to get you to that report. My my general recollection of the rationale behind the cost increase is that younger um, individuals tend to be healthier and less costly, and so removing those lives from the spread risk uh, had the result of increasing premiums. But there's I'm sure much more information in that. And we are now separating those markets because of changes. Um, right, that's the individual the and subsidy. small in in the, it, Yeah. But yeah, if you remove younger, healthier individuals from the pool, the price is likely to go up for everybody else. That's <laughs> been a constant dilemma. If we add covered services, the price for the remaining services goes up. So, Senator Lines, if you don't mind, if I ask a follow-up here, um, the way the way this is written right now, this this is another study. So, if we vote to support it, it's not 
saying we are raising premiums, it's not saying we are enacting this or that. This is allowing for a study to happen. And the next step would be for the legislature to take action upon that study. Yeah. So, I mean, there'd okay. have to be a legislative recommendation. Right. So have to, yeah. So many steps. Okay. Senator Lyons, go ahead. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, uh, I'm still absorbing a lot of the stuff we heard this morning. It was a lot of testimony, so I'm not sure I can fully yeah. uh, relate to, or you know relate all of it to our conversation. But to Senator Terenzini's um, point, I, one I think it was Devin or somebody <laughs> who mentioned that there have been tons of other reports done, and uh, including this one that's mentioned about Dr. Dinosaur. And I think um, having some reference to those reports, and I don't know how we reference because it sounds like there have been tons of them, but maybe some generic language that just says that the committee shall take under consideration previous studies or something like that. So it's, um, you know, there's some charge to look back at other things um, that have been done. Yeah, I think having a knowledge base uh, built into the committee work uh, makes a whole lot of sense because people people out there don't have a lot of that knowledge. Yeah, and yeah. there's no need to reinvent the wheel or restudy things that have been studied. So um, I, I would support that and that would sort of get at some of the concerns that I think tenant Senator Terenzini um, has about, you know, maybe doing something that's already been uh, studied and it, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Senator Cummings, follow up, and then Senator Hooker. I mean, I, I'm, just go ahead. The difference is that there have been changes in DC. And so I uh, if I'm reading this, it's to say, okay, we got all these studies, but have recent changes, cha you know, caused the change in the conclusions, and there will be more changes before we're done with this. Yeah, this is a really good point. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the goals of the committee in looking at what's going on is pretty key. Absolutely key. Uh, Senator Hooker. And just to follow up, you know, we do have to look at what's happening in D.C., but with regard to the, the reports that have already been done, it'd be interesting to see what recommendations were made and what things have been put into place here in the state, as well as, you know, what's happening now in D.C. So it, I think that there's a, a real value to looking back, but certainly a need to look at what's happening now. Yeah, no, I think that is the point. We don't, but I think as Senator Hardy has said, we don't want to reinvent a wheel. Exactly. You know, so we're, the goal is to build on what's there, but we, you know, just sort of identifying some of the good work that's been done and whether or not recommendations have been followed up on and so on. So, so there's a sense of, of uh, what we can do to move forward. Okay, any other questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just looking at um, some of the language suggestions that um, Jessa Barnard made. Mm -hmm. She had some specific language and I had just noted, oh, see her wording suggestions. I'm just looking at them right now and they might be helpful to consider um, that she has right. changes. In the same section, you made changes though so i don't know if they're consistent with um, what you were trying well, to let, do let, you know listen i i heard the same thing and i think that that we should probably give ourselves a little time and uh, a little time very little time <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh to go through go through that and i i wrote down the same thing senator uh, to i thought that some of those suggestions might fit so let's go through let's give ourselves that assignment Let's go through the testimony and and then as we come back to this tomorrow, I'm hoping we can get back to it tomorrow um, for some time and then firm up our discussion for um, markup and vote on Friday. So let's give let's do that. That's let's go through this uh, testimony and um, try to bring some thoughtful recommendations. We don't have to doesn't have to be a lot, you know, just enough to make it 
succinct and effective. So, uh, and we don't, uh, so we've heard a lot. So good, yep, good suggestion. Committee, does that make sense to everyone? I know no one has free time right now, but uh, can sit on the couch at the end of the day and do some very informative reading. <laughs> Right. I've been up late last, the last few nights doing the same with all of our bills. So yes. <laughs> I know. All weekend, all day, Monday. It's good. Uh, so that would help. And I know each of you has a specific interest. And um, my suggestion is, can we please make this a committee process? You're going to be inundated with people telling you what to look at and what not to look at. Uh, we've heard a great deal of testimony. Let's try to make this a, a committee process from this point on. And I know there are very interested people out on YouTube right now wanting to influence our, us and our thinking, and, and that's going to happen regardless. But I, I do think if we can make this a, a committee process, we're, we've got, this is a great group of people to do this work. Senator Hardy. Yeah, thank you. Um, to one quick question, and then to to your point about this being a committee process, is there value in making this just a committee bill rather than having it the number since it's a combination? I don't know what the process works right now in terms of, but wanting you know, say, saying it's a product can, of all of our thinking or that, that's a good question for our ledge council uh, to <laughs> to answer. So. <laughs> Hello, Jen. Um, Hi. I think that's really a policy slash political question. Oh, for you. darn. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to make it a committee bill. Whatever. I mean, either way, you'd do. still either it way, it has matter. not met crossover. So right, I don't, exactly. I don't so think I don't it know matters. About that. I yeah. know it's going to be it's going to be a heavy lift regardless. But so uh, I'm I'm happy to make it a committee bill as long as we can get to a place that we're all happy with. That's fine. Yeah. I just it's more for the your point about it all working together kind of thing. Um, but my other question is specific to the hearing aid section. Um, Jen mentioned when she went through the bill, whether or not the stuff that we are recommending to be put in the budget would sort of take care of the first steps of that, or if there's more that should be added to this. Um, it seemed to me like what we did there might move us Cover down it. that road. Yeah, I, th I think you may be right. And uh, Senator Cummings, did you wanna add something no i from conversations i've had it sounds like that the benchmark would be the way because if we add it then we have to pay the additional cost with state funds right if we say it's a required coverage okay. and it's not in the benchmark so i think that's the best place to have the discussion so, and Jen, is there anything else? I'm trying to remember, there were three sections and I know the, the is there any one of those sections that we might keep or should we just say the benchmark work is doing its job? Well, what I can tell you is what's in the bill right now. So what's in okay. the bill right now is, uh, or in the um, S-132, sorry, there's nothing in, in the language we were just looking at except the placeholder, um, is the section 12 of S-132 has the coverage for in the large group market, um, also Medicaid and state employees and um, teacher plans. Mm -hmm. Section 13 is the application to change the um, benchmark plan. So it sounds like you've wanted to wait on that until you've had the benchmark plan analysis. And section 14 is directing the Agency of Human Services to seek approval from CMS to provide the coverage um, that is called for in section 12, which as I said, they have indicated at least to me that they believe they already right. cover. And so that would be unnecessary. So I think those three sections are probably unnecessary given the work that the DFR is doing uh, and others on the benchmark plan. Right, so I think the policy question for you is whether you want to enact the large group requirement now or if you are looking to address it in all of health insurance at the same time after the benchmark plan review. Senator Cummings, go ahead. Okay. Um... 
do we have any analysis as I'm assuming these are the non ERISA, so essentially state employees and the teachers. Um, and right, and the the uh, commercial large group. Okay, that's spot. Um, do we have any estimate on impact on rates? I don't. I don't know if. Um, I mean, it's an actuarial question, so I'm, I'm not sure uh, if Nolan has heard from any of the carriers or um, the state employee plan administrator. And there, there has been some conversations about what the uh, impact would be, but I don't have anything that I could provide you at the moment. Yeah, I know that I know the insurance companies were interested in testifying and they are submitting some testimony in writing but I, this conversation might sort of obviate the need for that. But to Jen, or maybe Senator Cummings' point, you know, the state impact would be the state employee plan. Yeah. And I've heard enough from teachers about they have high deductible plans at this point. I think everybody wants it, but I'm not sure they want it to the tune of having their premium go up a thousand dollars. I'm not comfortable doing it without knowing. No, and I, I agree with you, which is, and I think if we wait for the benchmark plan analysis, that will help us make decisions going forward. And it's not just this committee, it's obviously your committee that's um, very much involved. So my, my suggestion is to take those three sections out but that doesn't mean we aren't very supportive of hearing aids for our citizens, regardless of age and uh, income and, and coverage. So just for the record, I, I don't see anything that would make uh, premiums go up a thousand dollars a year. I'm just throwing that out. I have no oh, okay. idea. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's when I'll start getting lots of emails. Wait, you're, you're influencing our thinking, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> okay, does that make sense to people though, uh, really to, to, I hate taking hearing aids out because I think they're so important, but we have that language that we're- uh, if, if the, Will the benchmark study also give, give us any information about the other plans the you know what it might cost for the other plans to add hearing aids it's going to be specific to the exchange mark well to the yeah. individual and small group markets because that's what the essential health benefits applies to uh-huh so maybe uh, ex uh, go ahead nolan sorry well i said i think blue i would recommend you talk to blue cross blue shield mvp because i believe that they have done their own internal estimates already I don't want to get rid of them. Yeah, I think both, uh, and they both, if we want to continue and add something in about having that analysis, um, then we should have them in to present. Right, you would also probably want to hear from DFR because I don't think that's within the scope of what they have requested the federal funding to do. Right. It's right, but could we, could we ask the private insurers to do that analysis and report back to us? Sure, we could just ask them and they probably have already done the work. Yeah, yeah. I I mainly because if we get information about the small group exchange or exchange programs and then we get information about the others, then we have it all together to look at and make a decision for everyone next session, right? That's uh, sort of I'm sending you emails about it already. <laughs> Probably <laughs> Blue Cross in and MVP in before we make this decision. I think we need to do that. So I think that we'll ask Sarah Teachout and Charles Storo, who represents they represent their respective companies, and they have contacted me. And I will. Nellie, uh, did you think they would not? I, I, I think it's great. Um, Nellie, let's try to get them in first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, hopefully they're available. 
not the first thing because we have people on, but the second thing somewhere tomorrow. You may also want to hear from Cigna as I believe they have some of the large group insured market. Okay. Who's a Cigna representative at this point? Jen Kennedy. Oh, Jean. Okay, good. All right, let's do those three tomorrow, Nellie. And, and uh, asking them for written testimony that we just, you know, they understand the gun that we're under, the time frame we're under. So if we can get their information in writing and then they can come in briefly. The sooner we get the information, the better. That is a message to the YouTube world. Please, please get us what you have. Okay, that was, that's good. I think that's a good place to, to end the discussion on hearing aids. Anything else? Getting back to the, the S120 draft that we'd looked at, I have at least for now put in uh, an additional item under powers and duties, I'm a new five and I move five to six to say, so this would be the committee shall consider the following, the findings and recommendations from previous studies and analyses relating to the affordability of healthcare coverage in Vermont. Excellent. And I hope that, that addresses the- Excellent. Issues raised, okay. All right. Okay, anything else? Slowly but surely, we're gonna make some progress. All right, so let's, this is our, this is our goal tomorrow. Uh, we'll find some time. Uh, Nellie will put, Nellie and I'll, however it happens, we'll, we'll put S120 up and we'll have the insurers come in and hopefully they'll get us some written testimony, pr testimony prior to our meeting tomorrow. Then, uh, I'm also going to suggest while we're just talking about tomorrow, please do read through H210 again. And there, there are a couple other folks who have asked to testify. They'll be testifying, but that's gonna be very brief testimony. And then we'll be talking about SH210. Then we'll also be looking at uh, S120. That'll be next in line. And then we'll try to finish off our work on H46 and H104. So that means to do a little bit of reading on those bills and thinking where we are on those bills. And then today, right now, Jen, I'm gonna ask if you would please uh, take us through H430. And I know there's been some, um, you've done some great work with Diva on this to help clarify what can and should or should not happen in the bill. So maybe I think put up the proposal, the suggested changes that DIVA was offering and then explain the reason why we have that, please. Sure, and Nellie has it posted. I think after some technical difficulties. Um, so if you, you may need to refresh again, um, okay. I will put up the language. Let me know when you're ready. All right, we have draft 2.2. Uh, Great. And this is the one that you have in front of us. So uh, Jen, go right ahead. Great. Uh, this is, so this is H430. This is um, expanding coverage under Dr. Dinosaur, although as we'll look at, it's really um, similar to Dr. Dinosaur um, for individuals who are not eligible for Medicaid because of their immigration status. And I um, <clears throat> did work um, collaboratively with Diva in coming up with language that they think will um, more appropriately meet the stated intent of providing coverage to individuals who are, um, <clears throat> we had referred to undocumented immigrants um, or people who are not eligible because of their immigration status. <clears throat> and the issue with that is that it, it potentially requires a full Medicaid eligibility determination 
with a denial based on immigration status in order to then provide this coverage. So in trying to allow for a more streamlined process um, to determine eligibility for this particular benefit, I have moved it to a different part of um, chapter uh, of title 33 of chapter 33 um, in the same chapter, but a new sub chapter that I've just called covered for additional populations. Um, and this would now be <clears throat> Dr. Dinosaur like coverage for certain Vermont residents. Um, because if we call it Dr. Dinosaur, it suggests they'll be on a program, which is a Medicaid funded program. This would be um, state dollars only. And so we're creating, um, but just for, for, I wanted to keep, if they thought it was okay, I wanted to keep this reference to Dr. Dinosaur because I think it's helpful to um, the rest of us in understanding what's contemplated. Good, that sounds good. Uh, uh, Darn, I was looking forward to having some creative name, but you, that makes a lot of sense. So that, so <laughs> yes, open to other suggestions, but oh, that's, that's why at least I, for we now. We like Dr. Dinosaur like. Um, so as used in the section, the term Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available includes migrant workers who are employed in seasonal occupations in the state. Um, that had been something that was a priority for the House Committee, the Health Care Committee. And then it requires the Agency of Human Services, and instead of saying requires them to provide Dr. Dinosaur, because as we discussed that in operation would not be quite how it worked, shall provide hospital, medical, dental, and prescription drug coverage, which is all of the coverage in uh, the Dr. Dinosaur program, <clears throat> to the following categories of Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available and who are otherwise uninsured. So this is children under 19 years of age whose household income does not exceed 317% of the federal poverty level and pregnant individuals whose household income does not exceed 213% of the federal poverty level for coverage during their pregnancy and for 60 days postpartum. Um, so this description here of, of who is eligible and the income levels are uh, aligned with what is offered in the Dr. Dinosaur program. Um, so the incomes are 312% with a 5% disregard. That's how we get to the 317 and 208% with a 5% disregard. That's how we get to the 213 um, for pregnant individuals. And then it allows AHS to adopt rules under the Vermont um, Administrative Procedures Act to carry out the purposes of the section. And then the remaining provisions are um, making conforming changes to use that new terminology and the new location where the language would be codified. So it still has 1.4 million in one-time funds to the Agency of Human Services in FY22 for grants or reimbursements or both to healthcare providers for delivering healthcare services during FY22 to children and pregnant individuals who, and instead of saying are undocumented immigrants, we say who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available. And I wanna pause there for a moment as well. I should have mentioned under the undocumented immigrant piece, um, using that terminology, Diva had concerns that there were other types of folks who were not eligible for Medicaid because of their immigration status, but were not undocumented, undocumented immigrants per se. And these are things like the, and I'm not gonna get the numbers right, but the H1, agricultural worker visa program. Those people are, are in the country legally, but they are not eligible for Medicaid because of their, that is not an immigration status that makes someone eligible for Medicaid. Um, so that was a big part of moving away from this undocumented immigrant terminology and referring instead to immigration statuses for which Medicaid coverage is not available. Then we, so still now back to this 1.4 million in FY22. It's also for grants to Vermont organizations that work with members of, and I kept this language here, Vermont's undocumented immigrant community because it still seemed reflective of the types of organizations um, that you would be looking for, but I'm open to other language there, uh, or with members of the healthcare provider community to provide outreach and information about 
opportunities for children and pregnant individuals in Vermont who, and again, changing this language, have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available to access healthcare services at low or no cost in FY22 and thereafter, and implementing the technological and operational processes necessary for DIVA to administer the coverage for Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available as set forth in this recodified section beginning on July 1st, 2022. And then in section three, still asking for this estimate, but calling this Dr. Dinosaur-like coverage rather than dinosaur co Dr. Dinosaur coverage expansion. Um, and so requiring AHS to provide information on the estimated FY23 costs of providing coverage to Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available pursuant to 33 VSA 2091, beginning on July 1st, 22, as part of the agency's FY23 budget presentation to the various committees. And then uh, in the effective date section, section two is the same, or, or sec, uh, subsection A is the same, uh, subsection B, again, making this language change and the codification change, keeping the language about subject to appropriations for the purpose. Um, and then renaming the bill, and I'll put this in proper format if it's an amendment, but renaming the bill to an act relating to expanding coverage for uh, spending eligibility for Dr. Dinosaur like coverage to all income eligible children and pregnant individuals, regardless of immigration status. Terrific. Um yeah, and with the explanations going forward, and th there is time here for some fiscal analysis. It doesn't go into effect right away, so that that's helpful. And and just in terms of the administration of this, that was was which was a question that I was going to ask. So, um, and I just I I just have to share with folks because this brings back so many memories to me um, about my work with um, migrant workers years and years ago and have continued somewhat, but in establishing a, not just a migrant care program for kids, but a family clinic and going around and taking people to the hospital and then uh, accessing a, a physician or two to provide immunizations and take care of kids and families. And eventually we established a clinic for these people. And today that clinic has expanded from one area, farming community area to cover, uh, I think it's the whole county, a, a huge county in New York, but I'm so, this could be the beginning of something good is what I'm saying that never know. So anyway, questions for Jen. Jenny, can you see Senator, Senator yeah. Cummings does. Okay, I can't see you, Senator. Okay, okay. I can see me and I can see you. <laughs> All right. Um, Vermont resident, is that term going to give us any issues if you're talking oh. about people in on a farm workers visa they're here for a month two months to uh, harvest apples it's my understanding from diva that their rules address um vermont residency and are fairly broad in their uh in their interpretation of it while still requiring some kind of a physical presence here so there, later on in the bill, you said uh, there is the seasonal uh, folks. And so- Right, that's right here in the beginning. It includes yep. migrant workers who are employed in seasonal, seasonal occupations. So they are considered by Medicaid uh, residents. I'm trying that's to- my, Right, that's yeah, my okay. understanding. Um, yeah, that they okay. and they showed me in their health benefit eligibility and enrollment rule. There is a quite extensive yeah. um, description and definition. Okay. Good question, Senator Cummings. Any other questions? I can't see you, so if you have a question, please speak up. Okay. Uh, this is Ruth. Um, 
I, I had sent Jen a few um, comments last night and I can go through those. There were three, two pretty minor and one that I needed Jen's advice on. Um, go ahead, why don't you uh, find the place in the bill? Jen, would you know the spot in the bill? Yep. We can I think the first one is right here. So I figured I'd okay. just leave this language right up. Yeah, so. that first one is right there to just add um, um, seasonal and uh, agricultural occupations in the state. And the reason is I'm from Addison County and we have lots of dairy farms and dairy farm workers are not generally seasonal because you have to milk cows all year. So I just wanted to add that to make it clear it covered those uh, workers and the coverage. It says, but it says includes, my, it, it, the word includes means that they're that it goes beyond that so um yes absolutely that's meant as an addition to um <clears throat> you know to the extent that there would be a question about residents that migrant workers who are employed in seasonal occupations would be considered oh um, i see to fit I... this definition so um we could certainly say includes agricultural workers and migrant workers who are employed in seasonal occupations in the state if that's a a concern or of interest. Otherwise, I don't, I, I think this underlying language includes the people that you're talking about who are here year round. Okay. I, I understand that that includes now is about the temporary state status of residence right. rather than the, okay, that's fine. Um, and then further down in paragraph two, I believe on page two, The, and this is about the outreach and information. And I just was mm -hmm. hoping we could add culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach and education, um, just to make sure that, um, you know, right. when it's necessary okay. that it would be done in Spanish or whatever language is appropriate. Um, I know that this is often a challenge for state government. And so wanting to make sure that that is covered. This became a really big issue last year at the early part of the pandemic when a lot of the information about COVID was not translated yet. Yes, it was. And yeah, it's an, and Department of Health, we, we added language in some of our bills around this. So, so how would you say that, Jen? Is it, it, is, it should be related to culture and language or simply language? Culture probably is important. Yeah, right. I, just, I think Senator Hardy's recommendation of culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach and information seems to work. Good. If that's what the committee is interested in. Is anyone on the committee not interested in adding that? Okay, so let's do it. Okay, okay. so that I put that in my actual draft. Thank you. And then the final one, and this was what I needed your advice on, was some kind of guarantee or at least um, assurance of confidentiality. Um, this was something that we had oh. um, uh, included in the, the bill that we did about um, uh, the stimulus equity payments last year that started mm -hmm. in Senate Agriculture Committee um, and was a big concern about that to make sure that this information would not then be shared with the federal government and cause um, you know, deportation or, or any problems like that. So I don't know specifically where it makes sense or what the language should be. I believe Mike O'Grady had something in that bill, um, but Jen, I would defer to you on your expertise on that. Well, I'm looking up, I know there are some fairly whoops, significant confidentiality provisions around Medicaid itself. Um, and I just wanted to look at, uh, there is confidentiality of Medicaid applications and records. And I know we talked about this not being um, not Medicaid. Medicaid. But it's like it. Right, but I'm, I'm, let me check in with the DIVA folks. I think maybe just a, um, a cross-reference to this provision saying she'll be subject to the same confidentiality provisions as in this existing section 33 VSA 1902A um, might be sufficient. We could put that right in the um, in the statutory section creating this program. And then if you wanted, we could also put something in um, 
that outreach. I think that is a very good addition. Um, so something like, and the confidentiality of information submitted to obtain coverage, something like that. I'll look at that. Does that sound like what you're looking for, Senator Hardy? I think so. I, I just want to make sure we're just able to give people assurances that this wouldn't lead to deportation Trouble. of them or family mm -hmm. members or separation from their kids or anything like that, that is, you know, a very real and understandable fear. And so anything we can do to make those assurances. So if you want to check in with Diva, that would be good. Um, but just want to make sure we're explicit about it. Yep. I will. Um, yes. So that, that would be my thought. Let me check in with them, but I'm thinking adding something in section or I'll put the language back up and show you where I'm thinking. Um, share it first. So I'm thinking um, potentially putting in something like a new C here that says the agency shall adhere to the same confidentiality provisions as in section 1902A of this chapter, and then putting something here with the grants. So we already have the culturally and linguistically appropriate going in here uh, before outreach. Um, and then adding something right here at the end that would be, you know, and the confidentiality of any information submitted to obtain this coverage, something like that. So, uh, so Jen, um, yes. regardless, uh, the, even though this is a Dr. Donosaur like program, or, and as with any healthcare, this is HIPAA protected. Uh, well, this yes isn't that. No. This is. <laughs> I, I don't know how to answer that question. This isn't treatment. Um, so it's there are confidentiality provisions that apply, but okay. I'm not sure the extent to which it's specifically HIPAA in an application for coverage. So I, so I don't know how to answer that question. Okay, um, so forget I asked it, but I think that we should add the pieces in that we've been talking about here. Um, and may, I'm thinking maybe just to say in the confidentiality of information provided by applicants, something like that. Applicants and enrollees, I guess. Right. Um, <clears throat> or regarding applic, okay. Yes, I will work on that language um, in consultation with the DIVA folks. Thank you. Perfect. Sure, thanks for raising it. Yeah, no, those are good, those are good uh, things to add into the bill. So um, let's do this then, let's, uh, this is Senator Hooker. Did you have a question? Yes, thank you. Just a small point with regard to the renaming. Um, Jen, you have for doc, uh, expanding eligibility, but is this not a new program? Would it be more like um, just plain eligibility, right? eligibility rather than expanding since it's not really connected to the you're program. talking about the, the new title correct i think that's a good point yep i will take it out just eligibility for dr dinosaur like coverage for all income eligible children and pregnant individuals regardless of immigration status i think that thank you that's a good yeah, so keep your eyes open, go through the bill again, and Jen will bring back um, language for us. And this bill we will look at tomorrow, I think, rather than Friday to try and get it, uh, to try to get it out along with H210, uh, 46 and 104, and, and anything we have that spills over, spills over to Friday. I'm pretty sure 120 will be, um, We'll, we'll, while we'll talk about it tomorrow, I think that we'll probably finish it on, on Friday. Just, just the timing of it all. Okay, thank you. That's great. Making huge progress. Um, Jen, so let's take a look at the budget memo yet again. And I great. did make a, I, I forgot, I forgot something. So you'll have to help us. 
Okay. The 105% of Medicare. Right. So I put that in. I wasn't sure. I put it in under additional proposals for consideration because I don't think you have a dollar Heck unless no. you have a dollar amount. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I will just for now put the language up um, and then when we have it finalized, I can send it to um, Nellie. So the only two changes, I think, since we looked at it earlier, uh, that I, as I've highlighted them to make it easy to find. For additional one-time appropriations, we have $25,000 to the Vermont Donor Milk Center to provide Vermont infants and their families with access to pasteurized donor human milk, which is the term that they use. Does that look like what folks were expecting? That looks good to me. Thank you. Sure. All right. And then down here under additional proposals for consideration, um, I put in consider increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates for primary care services to 105% of the Medicare rate. Yeah, that's been a that's been an ongoing issue, um, and it help, does help to promote primary care in the state. The but the question is the what is the what's the fiscal note on that one? So we're not adding in the fiscal note. We're just putting it in as a recommendation. And if we can find the dollars for that, I think that would go a long way, both to keeping primary care docs and others, APRNs perhaps as well, but um, in the state and actually attracting more. So does anyone not wanna put that one in? Let me know now. Uh, Nolan, you have your hand. You know, want to put it in? No, no, that's not what my <laughs> hand is raised. Uh, I, Go I, ahead. I can't see you, so you have to speak up. So I did a little bit of work for this for Senator Hooker, and um, I did have an estimate. If cool. you want me to talk about it, absolutely. So I'm just reading my notes here. So Diva does have a program where they attest that the provider is board certified primary care provider. So that's an enhanced primary care program. These providers already receive 100% of Medicare for their identified primary care codes. So to increase, and so this is, diff, this is, this is so to increase the rates for primary care codes for these providers to 105% would be a $1 million gross. Now, the reason I highlight that is because it would be increasing it for people who are have been identified as a primary care provider versus just using a primary care code. If you did the, if you just increased all, if you just increased it to 105% for primary care codes, regardless of whether people are part of this enhanced primary care, so they might be like a non-primary care person using a primary care code, then that number is $8 million. So I think that if you, one way to, to, to specification you could say is increase primary care codes to 105% for those uh, board certified primary care providers who are participating in enhanced in Medicaid's enhanced primary care program. And that would be a million. So you could be spe specific or you can, so that's just, um, and by the way, those estimates are based on the 2020 primary care rates. So it'd probably be a little bit more than the $1 million, but that's yeah. just a few cents. Is there a way, do you think there's a way to, to have both of those in? So an or, um, as an or, I mean, one's, a, one's an umbrella, the $8 million, and then the other one is greater specificity. I, I think that if you say increase primary care rates for primary, you know, to 105% and just leave it as it is. Okay. It's unclear, yes. but could be as much as a million, $8 million. If you- okay want it to be clear, you could be more specific. Yeah, I, I think it does make sense to leave it as it is because then there's some decision making that can go on based on what funds might be available. Uh, go ahead, Senator Hardy. Um, thanks, Senator Lyons. I think, I actually think we should be more specific if we're gonna include this because our goal is to help primary care providers themselves. Um, these codes could be used by any kind of provider just that is doing something that would be coded as a primary care um, 
service is my understanding if I'm understanding Nolan correctly. So it could be like a podiatrist, not to pick on podiatrists, but <laughs> who might be doing something that would be coded as primary care. But if our goal is to really focus more dollars to primary care providers, then it would seem to me that we would want to be specific about it. And um, then it's cheaper also, but, but that's, I mean, this is benign. We're just including it in a list to consider. So, so if we, but you're right. If we put it in and it's, and it's uh, with specificity, it is cheaper. Uh, so then when the question is asked of Nolan, how much is this going to cost us? Oh, it's a million dollars. Maybe that's actually, and you can be more specific. You can be a million dollars gross, 440,000 general fund. Yes. Okay. So, okay. So, Senator Terenzini, any thoughts on this one? Senator Hooker, he's good. He's got his thumbs up. Uh, Senator Cummings. I like the more limited. Okay, let's do it then. Are you looking for this and you're still in the additional proposals for consideration or do you want a do an additional one-time appropriation dollar amount? Not one. Or I, I think it's in our no. wish. Uh, it's, it's it's more. In, it's in the additional proposals. Okay, yeah, I think it has to be at this point. And so, what was the language for the narrower version, so, Mullen? And again, and just to clarify, this is my. I'm explaining it in the way that it was explained to me. So I hope I did it justice. How I explained it. Maybe you'll hear from. I'm the, sure you did. From the medical society, being like, uh, actually, but um, <laughs> so I might say it. Um, you know, 105 percent of Medicare for. Uh, board, board certified primary care providers who participate in Medicaid's enhanced primary care program or something like that. Can you say that again, please? Um, to 100, 105% of Medicare for board certified primary care providers who participate in Medicaid's enhanced primary care program. And maybe Ness is listening and she'll send me an email clarifying a better way of saying that. But I was just I, I was just asking to have you repeat it because uh, Jen is typing away. Thank yeah. you. Entering data. <laughs> That's great. Okay. And then you could say it's a million dollars estimated to be approximately a million dollars gross or 440,000. Well, see, but that's 2020 rates. So it'll be a little bit more, but. So I just say approximately a million dollars gross or $440,000 general funds based on 2020 Medicare rates or something like that. Estimated to be something like that. And then I can work with Stephanie if they were to do that on a more specific number. Okay. Okay. Well, it's on the list and now we have an understanding of what it is and, um, I guess the, the Nolan does the word does the phrase board certified come to you from Diva or do they need to be board certified? I guess is my question. Right, I think that's quite a subset. Yeah, that is. You're muted, Nolan. If they're participating in the yeah yeah so what you exact sorry I did apologize I was muted. So oh. I, you're right. You could, I think you were about to go down that road. You can just say uh, physicians participating in the enhanced primary care program. Because so, so when you say physicians, do you really mean physicians, or because we had primary care providers, and that's sorry, providers who okay. participate in Medicaid's enhanced primary care program, and yes. Okay. Do we keep them as primary care providers, or it doesn't even? need to say that if they're participating in the Medicaid enhanced primary care program. I'm guessing that if uh, I if think primary they have to care test that they are board certified. So I think you're right. You don't have to say that. You can just say participate in. All right. But Senator Lines, do you want to keep it as primary care providers who participate in the Medicaid enhanced primary care program? Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, what does it look like? Uh, oh, yes. State. All right, let me put this back up for you. 
Give me. Sorry, school vacation week. Um, <laughs> grandkids are coming this afternoon. Oh, goody. <laughs> and they were here know, the last two days. They're, they're, they're going to have fun playing out in the snow, Senator. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. So here's how I revise that. Consider increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates to 105% of the Medicare rate for primary care providers who participate in the Medicaid Enhanced Primary Care Program. The estimated cost is approximately 1 million gross, 440,000 state based on 2020 Medicare rates. Okay. Committee. Senator Terenzini, Senator Hooker, Senator Cummings. Aye. Good. Okay. Great. Right. Senator Hardy, I know you're fine with it, I think. Yep, looks good to me. Okay. All right, so are we fine with our memo? This memo has taken its toll of time. <laughs> Will it be posted on our page or what's the, yeah. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I would, my plan, I didn't want to send, keep sending, you know. Yeah, uh, I think we probably need to get it off versions, to but tropes and then. We'll yes, and we'll but if you're it. good, I will. Should, do we need to vote on it? Now yeah, or? I think we just, you know, we don't usually vote on it. We just all agree that this is the memo we'd like to send. So is there anyone who is not interested in send it, sending the memo? Then we'd take a vote. I guess we're good. Thank you for all your hard work on this. It, it's been a, it's been, this has been a, this has been good work. So well, do you want me to send it to you to send to appropriations? You want me to send it to appropriations and copy you? What do you, how do you want to do it? Uh, how do we usually do that? Oh, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Just send it. Depends. It's okay. fine. Send it on my behalf and uh, on the behalf Sounds of good. the committee. Will do. All right. We're good. Okay. And it's the precursor to all of these money bills that we're sending out. So they'll get a flavor for what, what's coming. All right. So tomorrow I'm going to work with Nellie a little bit on restructuring the agenda, but we will start out with um, S210. And I know that there are people who keep asking to testify. Um, and and uh, so I keep getting people asking if they can testify. And the answer is we'll, we'll make a decision based on the time that we have. But certainly anyone uh, who is very much interested in S210, because it is an important bill, should please uh, submit some written testimony and if you have suggestions for improving the bill, that's good. But I also want to uh, warn us that you know we want this bill to go forward, um, and we're gonna if if there are differences that the House can't tolerate, uh, we'll have a conference committee. So uh, we we do want to make sure that the bill is as as uh, effective as we can get it. So we'll keep working on that one. And S104, H104, H46, uh, S120, H430, we're all on our agenda for tomorrow. So we're good. I'll see you all anon. <laughs>